How did the most modern passenger plane of its day crash on what should have been a routine approach into Miami for the pilots? That was the question posed to investigators looking into the crash of Eastern Airlines Flight 401. The aircraft in question was brand new, introduced to the airline market that same year. For 1972, the technology on board was well ahead of its time. The answers surrounding the cause of the disaster were found not to be with the plane. So what did investigators find when they opened up the plane's black box? What caused this deadly crash in the Florida Everglades? The early 1970s was the dawning of a new era in aviation. In the previous 20 years, jet-propelled passenger aircraft had become more mainstream. However, as engines became more powerful, so did the planes get bigger. The start of the 1970s decade was the beginning of an era for wide-body aircraft. This saw the development and launch of iconic planes such as the Boeing 747, McDonnell Douglas DC-10, and the aircraft of discussion today, the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. The TriStar was the last of the three to be introduced, and was done so through the American air carrier Eastern Airlines. Eastern, with the introduction of the new TriStar planes, used them to launch a new marketing campaign. The Lockheed L-1011 was, as stated, ahead of its time, no doubt. Lockheed Martin implemented the newest technology the early 1970s could allow. It was the first passenger plane to have an autoland function, meaning the plane could land itself, assuming the airport also had the correct technology installed as well. For passengers, the TriStar broke new ground in terms of comfort and noise reduction, Eastern Airlines even labeling the plane themselves as the Whisper Liner. If you weren't aware, despite its outward appearance, the plane actually had two decks. The regular passenger cabin was found on the main deck, but there was also a lower deck. This was sometimes used as a kitchen, there were even elevators to transport food between the two decks. Some L1011s even came with a downstairs lounge, certainly a feat of design as the plane was also able to accommodate the necessary cargo compartments and fuel tanks on this lower deck. For the pilots, they too could access this lower deck via a ladder in the cockpit. This would take them to an electronics bay below the flight deck. There even existed a small window through which part of the plane's underside could be observed. Despite the L1011's groundbreaking feats of technological advancement, efficiency, and passenger comfort, Lockheed only ever built 250 of these planes across all of its variants, making it less popular than the DC-10 and certainly so when compared to the 747. Despite that, the plane is remembered fondly by those who used to fly it. But it wasn't without its fair share of incidents. The disaster of Eastern Airlines Flight 401 was the first accident to have involved this plane, occurring on December 29, 1972. Eastern Airlines Flight 401 left New York City at 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the evening of December 29, 1972. Flying the Lockheed jet that night was a flight crew of three pilots. Captain Robert Loft, age 55, had been with the airline for 32 years, making him one of the most senior and well-respected pilots at the airline. He had accumulated nearly 30,000 total flight hours, but like all the other TriStar pilots, he was still new to the plane. His first officer sat to the right of him was 39-year-old Albert Stockstill. He was the most experienced on this plane, but even then, his hours in the L-1011 amounted to just over 300 by the time of the accident. He did, however, have extensive experience flying other aircraft. Sat in the flight engineer's position was 51-year-old Donald Repo. He was also highly experienced with over 15,000 hours logged but had just 53 in the TriStar. Interesting to note that there was also a fourth person on the flight deck that evening. 47-year-old Angelo Donadeo was a technical officer at Eastern Airlines, based out of Miami. He was traveling home as a passenger, officially off-duty. The flight continued as normal down to the Florida Peninsula and began descending to the airport in Miami as required. That night, the active runway for arriving aircraft was runway 09 left the northern, east-facing runway. Flight 401 was directed down the appropriate air corridors to line them up for that runway. All would appear routine, 
right up until the landing gear lever was moved to the lower gear position. This lever does exactly what you think it does. It extends and retracts the landing gear. To let pilots know when the wheels are down, indicating lights illuminate a display, one light for each set of landing gear. Every plane with retractable landing gear has something like this and could be as basic as the landing gear position completing an electrical circuit which would light the necessary bulb in the cockpit. On this occasion, the nose landing gear light failed to illuminate, and this puzzled the pilots. The captain's first thought was to retract and lower the landing gear again to try and get the illuminating light, which once again failed to light up. Logically, this would indicate that the nose gear had not been lowered or did not lower properly. Having to land without all or no landing gear has happened numerous times over the years. Sometimes failures can occur, either from the extension or collapse of the landing gear on touchdown. Interestingly, a Lockheed TriStar was recorded to have had a nose wheel collapse during a runway overrun at Leeds Bradford Airport in the United Kingdom in 1985. Perhaps most famously of recent times, LOT Polish Airlines Flight 16 made a belly landing in Warsaw following a landing gear failure in 2011. Point is, it can happen, and is something that pilots are trained to do. In the case of Eastern Airlines Flight 401, however, there was no failure of the landing gear. The bulb which illuminated the nose gear had simply burnt out. Upon seeing that a dual extension of the landing gear failed to illuminate the light, Captain Loft took authority and radioed Miami Tower that they were making a missed approach and requested a holding pattern. Let's have a brief discussion about where Miami, or more specifically, Miami Airport is actually located. Florida is highly unusual. Miami is located on the southern tip of the peninsula. Miami Airport highlighted here sits in close proximity to the Everglades, a swampy mass that encompasses a large majority of the southern tip of Florida. There is not much out here. On that late evening in 1972, Flight 401 was directed out west of the airport to hold over this region and given a holding altitude of 2,000 feet. The pilots, as one would expect, would seem to program the autopilot to hold this altitude. As instructed, the pilots turned the plane away from the airport to try and troubleshoot what they thought was a potential landing gear problem. The pilots performed a test on the cockpit lighting. Scattered around the cockpit were various test light switches that when pressed would illuminate every light on that particular panel. It became clear that this individual light failed that test. The pilots were, however, not convinced that this was just a failure of the light. Flight engineer Donald Repo left his seat, opened the nearby hatch, and descended down to the electronics bay underneath the cockpit. At some point during this, Captain Loft turned around in his seat to speak to other crew members. Investigators believe that in when he did so, he nudged his control wheel with enough force that it exceeded the arbitrary force limit which kept the autopilot in control of the plane's pitch. This was further backed up after multiple TriStar pilots came forward in the investigation with the information regarding how they had similar stories of nudging the control wheel and the autopilot changing. The TriStar would begin a slow, unintentional descent towards the swamp below, leaving their assigned altitude of 2,000 feet. The TriStar did have an audible alert to indicate when the plane's altitude was offset by some 250 feet relative to the desired altitude as punched into the autopilot. In the distraction of the landing gear light, they never heard the alert. Investigators would later state that they could clearly hear it on the cockpit voice recorder. It was night time and Flight 401 was over the Everglades, with little to no illumination outside. Therefore, there was no reliable outside horizon. As the plane was descending lower and lower, the pilots were able to remove the faulty light to have a closer look in their hands. It is believed by some investigators that the pilots may have put more faith in the autopilot than they should have. The technology on board was still new, which may have created a false sense of security, meaning the pilots diverted their attention away from their instruments to troubleshooting the faulty light. If they were adequately observing their instruments, they would have seen the altitude decreasing on their displays. For air traffic controllers working that night, there happened to be another problem plane in the area, 
and so attention for the controller was once again diverted from Flight 401. Miami Airport in 1972 was one of the first airports in the world to receive and operate a more detailed radar display to controllers. They could now see flight information, heading, and altitude. Although it wasn't uncommon for the radar for a time to give faulty or incorrect readings. Though the controller working that night did reach out to Flight 401, it wasn't to confirm altitude. It wasn't until the pilots decided they wanted to come back to the airport and the controller gave them an instruction to turn back that the pilot's attention was returned to flying the plane. It was in the following seconds that the pilots noticed the altitude had decreased from 2,000 feet to just barely above the ground at all. It was too late. Eastern Airlines Flight 401 crashed into the Florida Everglades at 11.42 and 12 seconds in the evening. As the plane was crashing, fire raged through the cabin as the aircraft broke apart. The devastation left dozens of the 176 occupants fatally wounded. There was a significant number of people who survived the initial crash, but later died either at the crash site or later in hospital. Among those was Captain Loft and flight engineer Repo. Loft died at the crash site and Repo in hospital. For many of the surviving passengers, the swampy, bacteria-filled waters could have caused serious and fatal infection of their wounds. Some passengers faced the prospect of limb amputation to save their life. Eastern Airlines Flight 401 was an important moment in aviation safety. It was the first major air accident to occur with a wide-body jet. Multiple recommendations were brought forward, including the necessary actions of air traffic controllers to take the initiative and make contact with an aircraft that is in an unusual state. Lessons learned from Flight 401 were brought into the development and evolution of crew resource management. It's a key aspect of flight training that pilots are taught today. The accident is continually referenced for its vital shortcomings surrounding crew communication, situational awareness, and spatial disorientation. A discussion about Eastern Airlines 401 is certainly not complete without mentioning perhaps the most bizarre aspect about this disaster. Following the crash and investigation, months and even years after, passengers, flight crews and flight attendants at the airline began reporting sightings of the deceased crew members. It is unclear when these sightings of the supposed ghosts began but the stories became so widespread that books, music, and television shows were written about them. This all apparently stemmed from Eastern Airlines salvaging parts from the crashed plane and retrofitting them onto other aircraft. Such practice can be done assuming the salvaged parts are of an adequate state, but Eastern Airlines denied this. They also warned airline staff that they could be fired if caught spreading these ghost stories. A lawsuit was even considered against the publication of one of the ghost books, but this fell through. Nonetheless, it's an intriguing footnote for those fascinated by the paranormal. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you found this video to be interesting, be sure to like and subscribe as there will be a new video every Saturday. A thank you to my patrons over on Patreon, their names are on the screen right now. If you see your name here, thank you so much for the ongoing support. If you're interested, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and just £1 per month and get early access to all new videos 48 hours before they go out publicly on YouTube. The link to that will be in the pinned comment below. If any of you want to follow my personal Twitter, you can find that in the description of this video as well. We have a new patron to shout out this week. A very big thank you to Diana Bowman for joining the £10 tier. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. To wrap things up, I just want to say once again thanks to everyone who has tuned into the videos and hit the subscribe button. We have just surpassed 86,000 subscribers. The 100k is looking ever more likely. Hopefully we'll hit that sometime later this year. Anyway, I'm going to sign off on this video now. Have a great day and I will see you next week. Goodbye.